Hello everyone and welcome to a CMI event, How to Close Your Gender Pay Gap with the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us today. Um, really looking forward to what's going to be a really practical and insightful session, drawing from a range of different organizations, experiences, and expert advice. So uh, to begin with, do let us know where you're watching from in the comments box, and you can use that comments box throughout uh, the conversation to pose questions uh, to the speakers and the panelists that you're hearing from today. And obviously you can interact with one another as well throughout the session. And we'll be sharing a link in the comments box very shortly um, where you can actually go to the CMI website and open up a new toolkit that we'll be discussing today for gender pay gap reporting. So to set the scene a little bit, gender pay gap reporting is a really important way for leaders to understand how their business is performing in terms of gender equality. And being transparent about pay helps employers scrutinize their own practice and focuses efforts on taking action. And we know that the pandemic has created even greater challenges for women in the workplace and making the case to restore gender equality at work more important than ever before. So more women are more likely to have lost their jobs during the pandemic. And this means British businesses have lost their hard won gains over the last few years, which is bad for business and also bad for our economic recovery. And CMI knows that gender pay gap reporting is the simplest and most important thing leaders can do to accelerate progress, to help us build back better and more inclusively. And we know that leading businesses understand that gender pay gap figures are most impactful when they're used to drive action. They know that doing so will mean that their business is at the forefront of attracting and retaining talent, staying competitive and supporting, again, a more inclusive and profitable economy. So ahead of the 4th of October 2021, which is the new enforcement reporting deadline for gender pay gap reporting, CMI and EHRC spoke to organizations to find out what support they needed to join leading businesses in driving action to address gender pay gaps. And we've created a how to close your gender pay gap toolkit for businesses, which we're going to showcase during this webinar. And there should be a link appear in your box anytime soon. So please do open that up. And as we go through the session today, if you have questions, our wonderful panel will be answering those questions for you. And I can see that we already have people from all over the UK, Cheshire, Birmingham, Cumbria. It's great that you're joining us at uh, this lunchtime. And please do continue to let us know where you'll be joining us from today. But to kick things off, I'd very much like to invite Suzanne Baxter, Commissioner for Equality and Human Rights Commission. Hi, Suzanne. Great that you can join us today. Hi, Matt. Lovely to join you. Um, and delighted to be here to uh, to launch this really important event. You know, the gender pay gap is an important uh, piece of reporting for corporates, as you say. Um, and I think this toolkit will really help organisations. Absolutely. So to help you talk through that toolkit, it'd be great if you could just provide a summary of what people might expect to find in that toolkit. Um, we'll also have uh, case studies that feature in that toolkit speaking to you today. Um, so that would be fantastic if you're able to talk us a little bit through what to expect from the toolkit and then perhaps bring in um, from some speakers today who will really talk about what this means in terms of their own organisation. So over yeah, to you, Susan. Yeah, very much. Thank you very much. So delighted to be here to launch this really important toolkit for employers. Uh, and I think since the gender pay gap regulations were launched, uh, a few years ago, it's been very much the case that employers have been looking for guidance to not reinvent the wheel that others have already invented to help them get best practice to make sure that we get the impact from the regulations that were, was meant when they were introduced. So my background, whilst I'm a commissioner for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, I'm also as a background, have a background as a CFO. Um, I'm a non-exec director. I've been an executive director on boards. 
and I work with both small and medium enterprise as well as big corporates. So uh, I know this is different depending on the scale of organization that, that you're uh, coming from, but certainly the impact that it can have is, is universal. And I think the things we'll talk about today will be equally uh, relevant. But my experience in, in implementing, reporting, reviewing and advising on these gaps hopefully will be relevant today. So the EHRC has the obligation to enforce the gender pay gap regulations, um, as well as to enforce the Equality Act. And, and within that legislation uh, comes uh, the, both the obligation for equal pay to be observed uh, within the UK, but also to make sure that organisations are complying with pay gap regulations. Uh, and up to now, around 10,000 organisations per annum have been reporting their gender pay gap, and that information is available publicly for all reporting organisations. Um, and we've had a 100% compliance, so we're very much looking forward to hopefully continuing that, and where organisations are finding it difficult to comply, to work with them. So now we're talking today about a toolkit. This is very much not just about compliance, as I say, but about looking at the impact that the regulations have and making sure that they do what they're supposed to, which is to affect uh, fairness in the workplace and to make sure that men and women are paid fairly um, for the work that they do. So we've produced this toolkit following conversations that we've had with business leaders who've told us that they've wanted to understand more about the business benefits that action planning to address gender pay gaps can bring, how it can affect their workforce, and to enable them to get access to any learning or resources where they can apply this in their own business. This point about not reinventing the wheel, I think, is particularly important. And so we've therefore developed a toolkit with the CMI to provide you with a series of case studies from business leaders who have successfully used the reporting requirements to identify effective actions to understand and address pay gaps. And these have made their organisations more competitive. They've built staff engagement, which I think is really important, and attracted new talent. Within their case studies, businesses have shared why they prioritised action planning, the lessons that they've learnt and the benefits that they've realised. We've also produced and provided links to evidenced actions and practical how-to guides from the Behavioural Insights team, who we'll hear from later in this event. There are also recommended actions and resources from the EHRC, which will help you when you develop your response to gender pay gaps and your plans to address the issues they identify. Some of these recommended actions include setting yourself targets for what you want to achieve. And, and that may sound obvious, but actually, unless you decide where you want to be and what's right for your organisation, it's unlikely that just seeing gender pay gap figures once a year will make any difference to the people in your organisation. We've talked about setting time limits for when you have wanted to achieve change and, by, and about being realistic and not overly ambitious. Ambition is really important, but we need to make sure that the plans that organisations put together will create change over time. Um, it's almost impossible to do things instantly, and particularly in the current economy where organisations are working with complex um, other agendas, it's important that the ambition is fitted in with the overall commercial model that the organisation has. And thirdly, making sure that your data is used to identify the actions that are most appropriate for your organisation. This really isn't a one size fits all. There will be different data sets depending on the kind of industry you're in, uh, the kind of uh, gender skew that often exists within industry groups. And some industries may be more heavily biased in terms of women or male uh, uh, employment. And that will influence the way that you tackle the gender pay gap. Some of the recommendations for the actions of coming out of these case studies include um, uh, also looking at communication strategies. And I think that that's really important. As I said earlier, the gender pay gap information that's reported by organisations is available publicly. All your employees can look at it, all of your future employees can look at it and can choose how to take their employment capital to your organisation or elsewhere. And so I think actually making sure you've got the right communication strategy around this that explains your approach to pay, that will help to build transparency and ultimately trust. 
These principles are important for organisations, as I say, irrespective of scale. SMEs, large and international businesses will all have different things to consider. But ultimately, we do need to look at the impact that this is having and that gender pay uh, has in an organisation on the individuals there. And our organisation and our lens today is very much organisational. But it is important to not lose visibility of why this is important to our employees who, as many organisations will say, are the most important asset in their business. Gender pay gap gives a useful spotlight on, useful spotlight on equal opportunity for progression and for fair and legislatively robust pay policies. Our people, of course, seek interesting work, challenge and development, but pay is really a fundamental. Uh, and giving, it, giving personal choice to individuals, it impacts standards of living, it impacts families and individual well-being. So it will be a critical factor for every employee, irrespective of the other career and softer agendas that they may have. And I think it's every employer's duty to get that right. And I believe that the gender pay gap rules, if used well, can really help be a helpful tool to assist that. So I'd like to thank the organisations who shared their experiences of gender pay gap action reporting in our toolkit. And they are Centrica PRC, Home Group, University of Huddersfield, Robert Half and SSE. Through their case studies, the toolkit also identifies three key areas which are important to consider when action planning. And they're thinking about how reporting affects your ability to recruit your talent pipeline. Future employees increasingly want to know what your organisation is doing to tackle the gender pay gap, and you should be prepared to answer that. Boosting your employee engagement in this area to both promote transparency and trust, as I've said, and identify untapped talent. And being aware of your procurement channels, and I think this is particularly important. There's a real value in the power of the pound here. Suppliers, contractors, customers and clients may go elsewhere and indeed you may choose to too if you can't demonstrate how you are prioritising diversity and inclusion in the way that you operate your business. So to talk us through these themes in a bit more detail and to hear directly from the businesses who are show showcased within our case studies and our toolkit, I'd like to welcome Nasheen from Home Group and David from SSE to join me in a panel discussion. Welcome to you both. Hi. And just as a means Thanks, of introduction, Susan. thank you. Well, as a means of introduction, I'll just give a bit of a highlight as to uh, their backgrounds. I think they're both very experienced individuals, as you'll hear, and it will help you to think through any questions that you might have uh, in the audience to them. So turning to David, David has over 30 years experience in HR and has worked with in a number of areas. The 30 years has spanned three 10 year spells at FTSE 100 companies in financial services and in the energy sector. And David is currently head of reward at SSE where he oversees reward, employee benefits, DC pensions and executive remuneration. So quite a pile of responsibilities. SSE, I know, are very passionate about this and have been publishing their gender pay gap since 2016. And David has been part of the team trying to get a greater understanding of the drivers behind it and what practically can be done to close it. I'd also like to welcome Nasheen, who's with us from Home Group, and they are one of the UK's largest housing associations. So a very different sector and lots of different um, uh, issues to deal with in that organisation. Nasheen is responsible for the group's corporate strategy, product development and communications. She has held several roles and senior roles in marketing over the last 20 years. She is an active member of Home Group's Women's Colleague Network and also the exec, so exec sponsor for the BAME Colleague Network, championing equality, diversity and inclusion across the organisation. Nasheen represents Home Group externally on diversity matters including the Women's Leadership Forum of the Northeast Chamber of Commerce. Both Nusheen and David kindly provided excellent case studies for our toolkit, and you'll have an opportunity to read through those. And they are examples of businesses who have successfully action planned and seen the benefits. And so I'd like to ask them both a few questions today so we can hear from them and what they've learned in prioritising action planning and their top tips for businesses looking to take similar actions. 
So firstly, David, if I can start with you, could you give us a brief overview of what steps you've taken within your, your business to prioritise action planning around the gender pay gap? Okay, thanks Suzanne and uh, can I just say good afternoon to everybody joining today. Um, before I get into the detail of this, I thought I would give you a little bit of background about SSE just briefly and, um, and to start off with I would say that sustainability is at the, the heart of everything that we do in, in SSE. We, we're striving to become a leading energy company um, in a net zero carbon world um, and we have been uh, transforming and continue to transform our business um, to, to achieve that goal. Um, we've, we've really flipped from uh, a thermal production of energy over the years into renewable energy. So we uh, have significant wind farm resources um, onshore and we're a, a leading provider on the worldwide stage of offshore wind. In addition to this, we also have hydrogen in a hydro plant, um, a lot of water based stations up in Scotland. And we're investing hev heavily in new technologies such as hydrogen, ground source heat pumps, solar and larger scale batteries. We are also in the business of making money. But at SSE, we um, are pretty clear that that's solely, it's not solely for the purpose of our, our shareholders. Uh, we have responsibilities to a much wider stakeholder group that includes the shareholders, the communities that we, um, that we serve in, um, our customers, those in the supply chain, um, and obviously, not least their employees and the family units that they uh, that they come from. So we try and articulate this all in a sustainability report that we um, we publish every year around about the same time as annual reports. It's a sixty page document. Twelve of those pages are dedicated towards employee initiatives, and this is where we also provide our main narrative on gender pay gap. We dedicate six pages to try to get across. Um, what we're doing um, on the pay gap and what we think about it and how we understand it. So, so that that gives a little bit of background as to where we are as an organisation. So, um, we said in the in the update, um, Suzanne was saying that this is something we've been doing since 2016, and uh, and we actually took the decision to start looking into this in more detail in 2015 because we thought it was a good fit for what we are what we're about really culturally as an organisation. It's important to us, and we wanted to understand what the drivers were behind this. So. Two years before we were mandated, we were sort of in this space. We were we were we were using our own numbers, um, but we were more importantly trying to tell our story um, and articulating it and what we we're going to do about it. So, um, in a nutshell, um, the issues for us are about low representation of women in um, in uh, senior and more highly paid technical jobs. Um, we've got fewer women actually applying for, for, for roles internally and externally. Um, we have average tenure that's, that's quite markedly different, um, where males um, stay with us for an average of 13 years and, and females eight years. A lot of these things are connected with the supply of um, females entering the energy industry. Um, and going further back, um, it, it sort of strikes a chord with uh, representation in STEM subjects. Um, so these are the things that were in the, the backdrop for us. Um, and we decided that we'd, we'd need a sort of a structured way of looking into um, how we get to the position we're in just now. Sorry, I should say our gender pay gaps are around about 20%. And it sort of trickled downwards to around about 18, where we are just now. So uh, that's the kind of ballpark we're in, which is around about an, in, uh, an industry standard. Um, so yeah, so we've got an, an issue with um, female representation in the supply chain, and we decided to, to find a structured way of looking at this. So we we looked at uh, what's going on with recruitment into the organisation, how we treat people once they're with us, um, and how people's careers develop when they're here. So we sort of described this as our in, on and up strategy. And so for each of those areas, we kind of, we looked at different interventions. So to give you a quick idea of some of the things we're doing at a recruitment level, um, we run a number of school outreach programmes and they are trying to encourage um, females to take up um, STEM subjects more. We have uh, inclusive hiring training for all line managers that are um, in recruitment. Um, we have been looking at a STEM Turner programme for those on career breaks, um, flexible working in job adverts, we, we uh, opportunities quite a significant increase in flexible working opportunities. 
Uh, and in the job adverts themselves, we, we had a project looking at the way that we came across the our branding um, and, and whether this was actually turning um, people off from a, from a diversity perspective. And um, so there are a number of other um, initiatives in there which might have a bit more time to cover um, later on. Um, when we're talking about engagement and uh, our, the, the on part of our, our strategy, we've increased the flexible working opportunity from 10% in 2015 to 78% now uh, of all jobs um, that we're filling. We've really flipped that on its head. Like, why can't you offer up this opportunity on a flexible basis? And, uh, and that's been reinforced with um, some of the COVID measures now. Just now, it's really, it's really been a, a, it's really tested your thinking on flexible working. And I think the flexible working model has been proven over the last uh, couple of years through COVID. Um, we also increased, we, we beefed up our, our maternity packages quite significantly, where we're now providing 21 weeks um, full pay, and we will pay somebody their full contracted hours for coming back for 80% of their time, uh, their contracted hours for six months after they return from maternity leave. And in terms of uh, promotion and career development, um, we, we have done things like um, having more diverse shortlists for, for looking at promotions and into new jobs just now where We've got a next best candidate approach where there's a feeling that there's not enough diversity in the shortlist that's there just now. And there's a there's an intervention there. And we have more diverse populations in our leadership development groups. So what does this mean in terms of action planning and targeting? Um, for us, we're very cautious um, not to be putting big targets around our, our, our top level gender pay gap just now because I don't feel we, we really understand it fully enough and we're, we're, we're tackling that later on this year. Um, but in terms of um, uh, ambitions um, for us, in terms of female representation, we've got three senior groups um, that we've looked into, our, our group executive committee and the direct reports, um, that group plus the subcommittees and a population of individuals who are earning £70,000 or more. Um, and we've got targets to increase the first group to 30%, the second to 20 and the third to uh, 25 and the third group to 20. So we've 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 made good ground in all of those categories. Uh, the third group, 70K plus, is the most populous of those. And that's the one that's proven the most difficult to end. So we are investing a bit more time to trying to understand how we can uh, achieve those goals better. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for the organisation and where we are in this space and some of our ambitions. But we're on a journey and, um, and uh, we've still got a bit to go. Yeah, David, that sounds really impressive. I mean, uh, for me, I guess the thing I pick up from that is that you look at the life cycle of an employee um, and you very much map it to your strategy. Uh, and I think, you know, that that's a board led, led discussion. Um, and I think it's a, as you say, it's a long term journey. Um, but I think, you know, should should give you reward at, at many levels. Um, maybe now if I can talk to Nasheen and ask you the same kind of question in terms of the steps you've taken in your business, clearly a very different business as it's a housing association um, and with, you know, I suspect very different kind of budgets that go with that too. But, um, but talk to me about, or if you could tell us about how you've prioritised um, gender pay gap reporting in your organisation, that would be great, please. Sure, thank you, Suzanne. So, um, Home Group is, is one of UK's largest national housing associations. And um, just to give you some figures, we provide 55,000 homes to uh, around 120,000 customers. And uh, we have two and a half thousand uh, employees across the organization. Um, in terms of uh, our action plan and um, the, the work we've done to prioritise that. I think uh, first and foremost, our inclusive culture is very strong and it penetrates across the organisation. Um, and we've always been passionate about diversity and inclusion for our colleagues, but also for our customers. Um, our culture aims to ensure that everyone is treated with dignity and respect and that we work on that continuously to build a fair and inclusive environment. Um, one thing the gender pay gap reporting has really helped us to focus um, action is um, is really kind of um, help us to accelerate our thinking in this area of work. Um, our workforce is currently 64% female and our gender pay gap is at 15.7%. 
um, which is good, but we still have a long way to go. And we don't shy away from that because we have a fantastic opportunity to make the work environment brilliant by continually evolving and improving it. And then on a broader level, um, gender equality creates economic benefit, which we know is um, pivotal to um, certainly our sector, but more broadly, um, uh, the economy as a whole, certainly the green economy, we know that we've got a housing stock which is um, aged and uh, you know we've got a huge challenge ahead of us getting to net zero and uh, with that we face a huge skills shortage. Um, so we understand that we have a direct role to, to play here to help develop our colleague skills and support our customers' aspirations but those um, skills um, that are required um, need that focus on gender equality and gender parity. Um, so by collectively uh, working to reducing the gender pay gap, but also in, uh, in improving opportunities for women, we know that we can um, help plug that current void in skills and um, reap the economic benefits on the national, local, but also on an individual level. And I think we've got to move away from just talking the talk um, to actually doing, which is why uh, an action plan is so important. So turning your um, uh, turning the, the the chatter into meaningful actions, um, and that's what we've done uh, by having uh, an action plan. And the it's also, I think, really important to remember that um, we are many things and we experience things differently. So gender equality covers race, disability, sexual orientation, and, and therefore we have to be aware uh, of these overlaps and intersectionality. Um, and it's also important that we keep the plan simple and focused, which is something, Suzanne, I know you mentioned, and it's those small steps that um, lead to, you know, the bigger improvements as we work through this, we've got to be realistic. And some of the themes our uh, plan covers is uh, leadership support. I think it's really important to have that visible and strong uh, board and executive presence and sponsorship. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, me, for example, I'm a, I'm a role model and I spend, uh, you know, quite a bit of my time speaking to, um, uh, you know, younger females as part of their sort of induction, as part of uh, uh, as part of a mentoring program, um, to ensure that you know we we are visible um, at that leadership level. We also have a very strong learning and education and career progression. Uh, culture. So, um, for example, we have female apprentices across all functions. Uh, we think it's really important to monitor and measure outcomes. Um, an example is regular reporting and data reviews um, to show the entire organisation how we're progressing and not just talk about it annually or, or quarterly, for example. And we have something within our sort of core culture called brilliant conversations. And um, this is where you know a, a manager has a conversation with um, their direct report, but it's about encouraging managers to have that proactive discussion with new parents, for example, regardless of gender, promoting flexible working and return to work options. Our policies are also reflective um, and supportive of um, gender parity, so flexible working policies and using feedback um, to ensure that gender equitable and, and, and that there is that flexible culture for women. Um, our recruitment strategies, can, so we continue to tailor these in areas where the gap is, is the highest. And again, our action plan and the data enables us to focus on those areas that, that need attention. And we use skills-based assessment tasks in our recruitment processes uh, alongside interviews, the uh, sort of interviews for roles. And we've um, adopted the Rooney rule and extended that um, to uh, gender um, as well as um, to BAME candidates now. Um, and we ensure that senior posts, for senior posts, that women applicants are shortlisted and being interviewed. So we take positive action 
to ensure that we get that diversity right at the offset um, when we shortlist applicants. That sounds great. And I, I love your focus on the individual there. I mean, I think, you know, it is very easy for this to become a kind of a reporting and a corporate uh, activity. But I think the impact it has on the individuals, the recognition of the individual within the organisation, I think is really important. And actually, you know, I think as an, as an organisation helps you with that overall sort of sustainability goal, because it creates a sustainable employment environment that people want to continue to work in. One of the things I'm interested in is, uh, you know, clearly, you know, this this runs to the heart of your organisation, um, and 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 in the current environment, everyone's looking for business benefits and enhancement in the competitiveness or the way in which our businesses can be differentiated by the actions that they take. And I just wondered, you know, is there a kind of particular benefit that you would highlight in terms of the success of the organisation that's come a, come about by your approach here? Um, Nasheen, maybe if I can ask you to con sort of continue on that. Sure, uh, we've got some um, really good statistics that show um, that showcase, and I'm quite proud to talk about this. That showcase the benefits. So, for us, colleague engagement is key, and um, it, you, you know we've prioritised uh, within our plans um, things like the uh, network group, which is called Women of Home Group, which has a a very strong and vibrant uh, kind of feel to it. Um, and our annual Great Place to Work survey sort of tracks the satisfaction by gender. And these are the statistics that I'm really proud of. So 80% um, of, uh, of co colleagues, of, uh, female colleagues said, I am offered training and development to develop myself professionally. 76% um, of our female colleagues um, have said, I can fulfill my career aspirations. 69% of um, people are paid fairly for the work they do. And 96% said people are treated fairly regardless of gender. 91% have said, taking everything into account, I would say that home group is a great place to work. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we have um, a senior leadership program, which is um, which helps um, colleagues develop um, in terms of career. And that program, we did one specifically for women into senior leadership. And that saw 32% of uh, delegates have a promotion or job within the first six months of having completed that leadership program. Um, so, you know, some great statistics there and we're really proud to be fourth in the UK for super large companies for a great place to work for women so uh, again something that I'm I'm really proud of and these results do speak for themselves and demonstrate the success of our focused approach um, and we've seen a uh, an increase in attraction and retention of women coming to um, work for us, specifically in the traditionally male dominated roles like IT and development. So it, it sort of completes the circle in terms of, um, you know, attraction and retention. Thank you. And David, maybe if I can come to you now, I mean, I'm, I'm very much interested. I mean, you, you work in a very competitive sector. Um, I'm interested in the kind of core business benefits that you're seeing tangibly from the policies you're adopting, but also what kinds of lessons that you've learned would you pass on to others? Because obviously some things work, some things don't, some things are more successful than others. So what, so what are those sort of key lessons that you think others could learn from? Um, okay, well, in, in, in terms of the, 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 the first question I uh, read about business benefits, I mean, we, we started this as much from a, a, a doing the right thing perspective as looking to secure some business benefits. But I think when you're mandated to report on something, um, it's, it's an opportunity for you to be assessed alongside other companies in terms of how you deal with that and develop your narrative. So from an early point of view, we saw this as an opportunity to um, give people a lens into the culture of our organisation and how important we see things like this. The, the second part for us is, is, is a more tangible one just now. There's a lot of companies in our sector investing a lot, as we are, in encouragement of STEM subjects at school. Um, and that sort of corporate might is going to bite at some point. There's going to be um, more females come into the workplace. And in, we see it more as a generational thing at the moment going on just now. Individuals are almost have their own little scorecards of organisations. And people are joining companies not because jobs are cool or because they're big or scale. 
organisations need to have a genuine moral compass. That's who people more and more want to work for. So we've got new individuals coming into this sector, perhaps with a less traditional mindset. So, I mean, we need to be on our game in terms of uh, how genuine we are, how genuine we feel about this subject and what we're actually doing about it. So there's there's, there's potential business loss or damage. There's There's been in the right place um, to... Uh, to be a, an employer choice for the the new supply that's going to come at some point um, because of the investment. So so yeah, so we we've taken it seriously here. I think as you mentioned just now, it's it's on an agenda pretty consistently at board level, translated down into a group exec committee, and individual kind of board committees now have responsibilities. So it's something that's been taken very seriously. In terms of lessons learned, going back, um, I think. Education is really important. Uh, those subcommittees and committees within the business, um, uh, what we felt was there was a real rush towards the need to look at the data and come up with targets. Uh, and monitoring your, your gender pay gap at, at, at group levels, one thing, actually breaking it down into individuals takes you into a whole new world. And I think there has to be a strong education piece as to what those figures mean for those businesses. Um, and I've been sort of advising a lot of people to stay away from detailed targeting at the moment um, until they have greater understanding. They can understand their future supply chains for recruitment um, as to whether they can actually meet those targets. You know, we kind of, as I say, we're going to have a deeper dive analysis this year and we're going to sort of uh, look at some hypothetical questions that are out there. But um, I have a feeling that if we stood still on this, our gender pay gap would actually grow because of the, the supply chain. So we, we, our interventions are, are a couple of percent that we've reduced so far. So, I mean, it may well be that in real terms, that's actually a better result than we'd expected because of the the, the, the the natural supply that's coming into the business and our desire, our need to recruit a lot of kind of operational people who stay on that bit longer, whose career develops further than their female equivalents uh, just now. So, so yeah, a big education piece before you start putting numbers down. Um, and an understanding that those are achievable in the first place. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think, you know, the de the devil's always in the detail, as they say, actually, isn't it? And I think understanding the, the direct impact for each individual's is for each individual business is, is really important here, particularly in a, a large conglomerate or, or an organisation with smaller but very different divisions. Um, before I hand over, um, Nasheen, maybe I can just pick up with you. If you were going to do this again, or if you were about to start this exercise, what's your kind of guidance as to the priorities that you would uh, invite uh, yourself or, or any business starting down this road to look at in terms of uh, generating success? I think um, first and foremost, it, you know, it, it needs to come from the top. You know, we, we have a we have a sort of a, a phrase uh, which forms part of our sort of group culture, which is shadow of a leader. And I think it's really important that that shadow um, is the right shadow because it does have an impact um, all the way across the organisation. So I think it has to start at the at the at the very top in terms of role modeling and making sure that there's a consistency in, in the messaging uh, with regards to, uh, you know, not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. So the uh, so the rationale uh, behind it as well. But I would also say that for us, um, you, you know, there was a key lesson throughout um, sort of co COVID and the impact that that has had. Um, so during uh, COVID, Home Group kept going and we um, continued to support our customers and all of our services remained um, open. Um, those in, in our office environments uh, were transitioned to work from home and we recognised for, for many women um, that they took on additional roles um, during homeschooling and also had um, additional caring responsibilities and, and therefore found it tougher um, uh, than men. So we kept um, colleagues and uh, and customers fully engaged during this time, and we had uh, what we call well-being brilliant conversations. We didn't furlough, uh, we didn't um, have any redundancies, um, and we supported the homeschooling program. So um, we offered um, equi additional equipment to um, parents who were struggling um, to get hold of equipment for um, homeschooling. We provided. Uh, incremental desks and chairs to um, support the home schooling in, uh, environment. And we continue to talk about the impact of, um, uh, of COVID. 
and um, how that impacted um, our colleagues in, in that hybrid um, situation. Um, but we also talked about other themes that were emerging throughout um, the pandemic, like domestic violence um, and the importance of safety. Um, so we continue to ensure that there is um, gender equality and voices are heard and that action is taken. Um, but I think um, the most important thing is to make sure that you stay focused and keep that conversation going. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that's been a really um, insightful discussion and, and we could talk uh, long on, on both of these subjects. So thank you both for your insight here. I'm sure we'll come back to you uh, with the Q&A. Uh, what I'm going to do now is, um, is hand back to, to Matt. Um, Matt, um, I know you've got um, our colleague Shashina now from the Business Insights team who's going to join us, um, but also potentially some questions that are coming in from the audience. So I'll hand back to you. Thanks ever so much. And yes, indeed, Machine, you mentioned brilliant conversations and we're having one here this lunchtime, which is fantastic. Thank you ever so much, all of you so far. We do have uh, questions and comments coming through on the chat um, and there will be a period for audience Q&A uh, a little later. Um, so please keep those coming through. I think the first question from Gemma um, was perhaps addressing something that David said. And then obviously there was a question from Cathy uh, you know, asking for a little bit more information about that data so we can perhaps ask you to mull those over uh, in uh, backstage as we perhaps bring on uh, Shoshana Davidson, uh, indeed principal advisor from uh, Behavioral Insights team. So hi there, Shoshana. Hi. Great to see you today. And so yes, we'll be we'll be talking through uh, all those questions that are coming through. But one of the kind of really important parts of the toolkit is that it's evidence based, and we've heard some of that coming through in the conversations we've already heard. Just really being able to refer to initiatives that work, and whilst one size, you know, won't fit all, there are obviously certain um, initiatives that can be taken to close the gender pay gap that we're developing more and more understanding on because of work indeed like yours. So. Um, Shoshana, you are actually principal advisor, as I mentioned, the Behavioural Insights team and leading their equality, diversity and inclusion team. Um, but you're also previously programme manager for BIT's kind of three and a half year, 2.8 million gender and behavioural insights research pro uh, programme. And that was actually a collaboration with the Government Equalities Office, which generated that kind of evidence on what works to improve gender equality in the workplace. So it'd be great if you could share with the audience today uh, your synthesis of that evidence on which you know the popular actions are more and less effective at really kind of making the change that organizations are hoping to achieve. So over to you, Shoshana, thank you so much. Great, thanks Matt. Um, and I'm actually going to present some slides because I find that talking about data uh, is sometimes a little bit easier when I can kind of show off graphs. So, um, yeah, delighted to be here today. Um, as Matt said, I'm from the Behavioral Insights team. Uh, for those of you who haven't come across us before, um, BIT was originally set up inside government back in 2010, uh, but has since spun out. Um, so we're now a kind of social purpose consultancy working with government, private and public sector organisations um, to really kind of um, on social impact projects. Uh, but we take a very uh, kind of behavioral approach to understanding why humans act how they do um, and also try to evaluate uh, things very rigorously. So uh, we like to run a lot of trials um, and see what the kind of causal impact of things are. Um, as Matt said, we have previously been working with the Government Equalities Office on a three and a half year research program looking at gender and behavioral insights specifically. Um, so our mission was to create new evidence around what works, uh, specifically with a focus on the UK labour market. So um, GEO kind of brought in gender pay gap reporting, um, and they also wanted to be able to help employers uh, by kind of being able to support them by saying what is effective and what's less effective in terms of actually improving gender pay gaps and gender equality more broadly. Um, so over the course of this programme, we worked with a range of different partners um, in different sectors, private, public, voluntary sectors, um, to run different projects, um, kind of targeting different areas of the employee life cycle, um, and ended up uh, running over 30 different projects. Um, so that was a mixture of kind of 
primary research studies where we implemented changes to HR processes, uh, evidence reviews, online trials, all sorts of things. Um, and through that program, uh, I guess because our aim was to generate this evidence, we also wanted to bring it all together and to actually uh, make it easy for employees to understand what next steps they should take. And so we produced some very actionable guidance and reviews of the evidence. So some of you may recognize um, these two documents on the left. This is guidance that we put out in 2018 that is available on the Gender Pay Gap Viewing Portal. Um, and recently, uh, at the beginning of this month, we've just uh, released updated guidance. And so this um, includes a whole load of new actions, and I uh, will be talking through that today. So what this guidance does, which we think is really helpful for employers, is it effectively summarizes actions into three different categories. Um, and so those categories are, the first is effective. And here, what we were looking to see is evidence that these actions have an actual impact on real world behaviors. And so what I mean here is that um, there's a lot of actions where maybe employees might say they liked something or they enjoyed training. Uh, but what we were looking to see was, um, do the actions actually impact on, for instance, the number of women in management positions or on the actual gender pay gap um, in that organization? So these are the actions that we typically say are kind of worth starting with. The next category is what we call promising actions. So here we think there's kind of positive evidence that these are going in the right direction. There needs to be a little more research done. So it might be the case that they work slightly better in different contexts or that we're not quite sure how to implement them yet for the best effect. So typically here, we would say that if an organization, if you've already done most of the actions in the effective actions category, consider kind of looking at some of these promising actions but it's worth making sure that you do actually evaluate them in your own organization to see what the effect is for you. And then the third category is what we call actions with mixed results. And this is probably the most cautionary of the categories. So these are the actions which either just haven't been evaluated at all or um, evaluations kind of point to quite different findings, uh, including, for instance, backfire. So some things that we see here that are sometimes incredibly popular and common among employers include things like unconscious bias training. So things that we know employees invest a lot of money in, but actually we're not sure they might actually lead to positive change. So um, this is um, a lot of information to take in, um, but the, the kind of evidence review um, includes 26 different actions. Um, you can see really easily which of the three categories that I just talked through that they fall into. And then the guidance is also structured to take you through the employee life cycle. So you can he see here that we've got actions related to leadership and accountability, um, quite a lot of actions related to hiring and selection, um, then looking at talent management, learning development, um, and then workplace flexibility. Um, and I was really delighted earlier, um, kind of hearing from David and Nasheen, just how many of the actions that both SSE and Home Group are implementing. And um, so it's great to know that so many of you are already kind of taking on board these evidence-based approaches. Um, I don't have long today, so um, rather than kind of try to get through everything quickly, I thought I would take a deep dive into one of these specific areas. So thinking about workplace flexibility. Um, and the reason for that is that um, this is a kind of flexibility is such a major issue when it comes to the gender pay gap. Um, this is a chart um, which is based on a longitudinal study by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the IFS. Um, and it, you can see here that essentially there is a gender pay gap between women and men um, before uh, women and men have their first child here on the left hand side of the screen. But once uh, women and men have their first child, that gap increases dramatically and continues to do so. So we know that this is a major uh, kind of division essentially for, for uh, gender pay. Uh, this graph compares mothers and fathers, I should say. And the reason that this happens typically is that a lot of women disproportionately tend to go part-time after having their first child and outcomes for part-time workers are much poorer than those for full-time workers. So this is very much a gendered issue. What we know is that if women and men work part-time at the same rate, or if part-time workers were rewarded at equal rates to full-time workers, that uh, gap which grows after people have their first baby would halve. 
So, so this is, yeah, just a, a ginormous rider, really, of the gender pay gap. Um, and something that we really saw in a lot of the data from employers that we partnered with. So um, our model when working with lots of employers was to say to them, um, can you provide us lots of your employee data for kind of five, 10 years, whatever you have access to. And we drilled down into it, went slightly further than the gender pay gap reporting data to understand what was causing the gender pay gap. Um, and a lot of the time, part-time working came up as a major issue. So um, knowing this and knowing the broader evidence, um, we ended up doing quite a lot of primary research in this area. Um, and I wanted to talk through a really interesting trial that we did today um, with Zurich Insurance and John Lewis. Um, so I already kind of explained that we know part-time worker is a driver of the gender pay gap. Um, and so what we know to be true is that uh, a large proportion of people would prefer to work flexibly, but very few job adverts are actually posted, which include explicit uh, part-time working options. Um, I believe from research by TimeWise that it's less than 20% of job adverts actually flag whether that's available. Um, and we know that um, people often just don't think about this and about whether a job can be done part-time if they don't have an external prompt to do so. So this was a really simple intervention. And we worked with Zurich Insurance. And what we did was we essentially tested an intervention to advertise all positions as being available flexible by default. So just turning that default on its head. Um, so individual hiring managers could still opt out. Um, they could create a, a kind of um, business uh, form saying, we really don't think this job can be done part time. But if they didn't opt out, uh, the default was that all jobs are advertised saying that they were available part time as a job chair or as full time. You can see here in this example that that was made really salient in both the title of the job advert um, in at the top of the job advert. And then we had this inclusive sentence at the bottom, um, which said that the role was available that way uh, because uh, Zurich Insurance wanted the best people with the roles and they recognized that those people weren't always available full time. So then what we were looking for was to see if there was an overall increase in the number of people working there part time. Um, we didn't find that overall increase, but um, there, there's a few different reasons why that could be that I unfortunately don't have time to go into today, but um, you can read all about in our report. But what we did see, which was really promising, was that um, this intervention increased the number of women applying for roles. So it increased them by 16%. And then when we, we uh, sorry, when we just looked at senior positions and management positions, that was actually a 19% increase in the number of women applying for those positions. So we thought that was really promising and we decided to replicate it with another uh, employer. And so this time we worked with John Lewis. Uh, the intervention itself, as you can see here, was incredibly similar. Um, this time it was only for managerial positions. And again, we had very similar findings. So we didn't see a change in promotion rates for part-time workers, um, but this intervention was kind of live during the pandemic. We had less time than we'd hoped for. And you can see here that there's a directionally positive increase. Um, but what we did see was that the number of applicants increased by 50%. Um, and this was a, a, a randomized control trial. So half of the jobs um, had this, half of the jobs didn't. So we can say that this was independent of any changes that might be introduced by the pandemic. Um, so this is really exciting because it just showed that jobs with part-time workers, uh, part-time options attract more interest. And that was driven by, again, an increase in women. So a really positive uh, intervention. Um, just to kind of highlight then that that was me talking through um, this action around offering flexible working by default and job adverts, which is up in the hiring and selection um, section of the actions. But we also have these um, additional workplace flexibility actions um, elsewhere in the guidance. Um, so just to wrap up, um, and sorry, I didn't have much time today, but uh, you can access the, the full guide on our website, which will give you lots of information about each individual action. And then to accompany it, we have five detailed step by step guides on five of the effective actions. So we've talked a bit today about setting targets um, and things like that. So if you are thinking about doing any of these things, these guides are kind of aimed at HR and DNI leaves. But if you want to do one of these things, and you want to know more about the evidence. Um, so, yeah, that was a really, really rapid um, run through of the evidence. Um, and I think I will hand back over now. Thanks. Thank you. 
really 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 interesting and we are hoping that we'll be able to uh, hear more about your research in further um, events and conversations around all the actions uh, that you've listed there um so it brings us towards the final section of this event which is to dive into some of the audience questions and answers and some of those will be uh, for Suzanne who has a vast experience as uh, chair and board member across a whole range of organizations um, currently at Mince, uh, Pinsent Masons, sorry, LLP, uh, Board of uh, Essential PLC as a non-executive director and consultant to Burrington Estates Group of Companies and also formerly a non-executive director and audit committee chair of WH Smith PLC and group finance director of Mighty Group uh, PLC. So a lot of experience on the panel today. Um, and so please do use this opportunity before we close in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes um, to, to send your questions through to us. Um, one of the things I'd like to pick up on um, to begin with, and this is something that really came through when we spoke to senior leaders, our Companions Network and other um, senior leaders at CMI, um, was this idea of really thinking about your talent pipeline and obviously research showing that um, over 60% of women would be more likely to apply for a job with an employer with a lower gender pay gap. So I guess the first question um, coming over to you on, on that is, you know, what, what more could be done to kind of increase uh, visibility and transparency of all these amazing actions and initiatives that we're hearing about? So Suzanne, if I perhaps come to you first on that particular question, and then uh, we'll move around the panel on that. So how can we increase the visibility of all this great work? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think I think something some things are moving in this space. I think certainly when the gender pay gap regulations were introduced, it was a case that organisations and boards probably had conversations around gender pay equality and 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 the progression of women within their organisations for the first time with some data involved. Um, and actually, I think that data was probably uh, not terribly well understood because I think as someone said earlier, you know, it's about kind of diving into the background and, and the detail. I think what organisations are doing now is publishing alongside the pure statistics an action plan. Um, and certainly that's something I'm seeing from the organisations I'm working with, that they're actually at board level considering and asking their teams to come back to them to say, you know, what is the, what are the issues around gender pay in our organisation? What are the issues around talent development and recruitment? Um, and how should we address them? What does that look like? And actually, what can we publish? Um, and clearly, those, those, those reports need to be pretty high level. They need to be pretty punchy. But certainly, I know from my own experience of having you know, daughters who are about to enter the workplace, they will look at these kinds of reports on companies' websites and will make a very quick choice as to whether or not they think an organization is culturally aligned to helping them develop as a young female in a competitive environment. So I think the more organizations can do, the more boards can challenge them to do, to actually publish action plans, the better for their long-term um, employment pipeline. Fantastic, thanks so much. I completely agree with that point there, Suzanne. And um, so going over to audience questions. So um, David, um, as I mentioned, before we took a short break while Shoshana uh, obviously dived into the detail for us. Uh, so Gemma asked how uh, SSE ensures mothers returning from maternity take advantage of the 80% of hours offer. And so perhaps uh, if you could you know, summarize that and then also why does that point, uh, do you ever find any kind of pushback on these kind of offers? And if so, how do you, how do you tackle that? Okay, um, this was, uh... This was initiated as part of a wider review that we had um, looking at a range of, of benefits. So um, there was an upgrade to the maternity leave provision. There was a, um, a, a whole range of new support measures um, that went in there. And um, to be honest, I, had, I, I was going along to our executive committee to get sign off for all this. And I kind of felt like it was going to be a bit of a dragon's den um, type scenario looking for the funds to actually do this. But it was quite the opposite. There was no real debate about this. They were just like, this all makes perfect sense. This is where we should be channeling our, our investment. Um, and I actually came out of that with a little bit more money than um, I was effectively pitching for that I thought at the time. So that acceptance that we talked about previously was there from the beginning. And that won't be there in other, all organisations. I, I have to accept that. But 
Um, that was helpful for us um, in answering your question about the, the the detail behind this particular arrangement. Yeah, we 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 set up a team within HR to look at um, how we how we're going to manage this, and uh, so we have like a, a manager's toolkit for returning maternity leavers, um, and we changed um, the a part of the that toolkit uh, for this scenario. So the line manager has to document what the agreed new working pattern is round about the new working hours that actually comes in. So and that then feeds into the paperwork the individual receives. So there's there's that there's a contract and an understanding there um, right from the beginning and um, that that's what the situation is. And it's a situation that we monitored through our kind of grievance procedures, through word of mouth, through line management, through HR. And uh, and yeah, it's it's been a success. Um, um, you will get the odd grumbling um, from a line manager where it doesn't suit the circumstances. But the bigger picture is this is this was an absolutely great new idea, great thing to introduce, and um, and yeah, and it's it's gone down well in the organisation. So yeah, thanks ever so much. And so um, mindful that we're going to kind of draw to a close in about fifteen minutes, and this is a huge question. So perhaps uh, asking you to answer relatively briefly on this one machine, but. Uh, earlier, you did talk about home groups, data reviews, and we've had a question asking, you know, how do they work? What data do you share? How is it shared? Who and how often? Um, I suppose, you know, there's two things here really is, you know, where where would you, as obviously the toolkit today, you know, um, where would you be sharing that kind of information? And then could you just summarize a little bit about your data reviews yourself? So um, how do you share best practice and, and your data reviews? Sure. I, I think um, the first kind of principle is um, not to see this as a bit of compliance, but more about something that is intrinsic to creating that inclusive culture. So I think that 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 is a key principle to to adopt in in all of this. And um, so, um, but you know, data is key to it. And uh, you know, aside from the annual um, uh, compliance submission, we do ensure that all teams, all managers, understand their data, their individual sort of team makeup, and what that looks like from a diversity perspective in terms of people makeup. And that's not just the the, the pay gap reporting; that's all sort of diversity and inclusion um, data, be it sort of um, a mix of diversity, for example, so the number of um, colleagues who are uh, perhaps either disabled or uh, from a BAME uh, background. Um, so really understand um, your your data, but also take ownership and accountability for it as well. So, you know, what action plans are you as an individual manager going to put in place to ensure that there is more um, diversity within your um, team makeup? So, so that's what I meant by not just looking at, looking at the annual submission, but really understanding the individual teams that make up that entire organisation and, and take some accountability and, and localised action planning around that. Absolutely. And yeah, great, great to kind of start getting into some of those subjects and obviously uh, can go into that in a little more detail. I'm just going to obviously check the comments and please do keep those questions coming through uh, with any further questions and comments. I guess, um, you know, I asked about pushback on initiatives earlier and Shoshana, coming over to you, I mean, you know, you presented a really great example and, um, you know, I just wanted to really kind of bring out the message that's in the talk is about positive action because I think there's, you know, and I'd love to hear Suzanne come in on this as well after Shoshana, you know, do, do we think everybody understands what positive action is? And, you know, if you have, for example, maybe men in the workforce pushing back to say, I get less from this, the example you gave obviously shows that no, the applications were from women applicants, the number of women applicants increasing, this wasn't less men in applying. So I guess, you know, what does your research tell you about this idea of how organisations can take positive action and really communicate what that means more broadly. So over to you and then Suzanne, love to come to you on positive action as well. Yeah, so I guess, um, oh, sorry, there's a bit of an echo. Um, one of the things I would say is that for any organization, if they're kind of looking at what to focus on or what to change, again, it helps to use data to kind of explain that. So if you know that you have certain grades or certain occupational functions where women are underrepresented and you can explain why you're therefore taking action targeting that area that's probably going to be something which is helpful to do um rather than kind of talking about you know increasing applications from women if you already have 60 percent applications from women so 
you know, first start by kind of understanding where to target and hopefully that rationale will uh, be understood by people. Um, I think one of the things that we tend to try to focus on is changing systems and processes rather than hearts and minds. So naturally, people will need to understand why you're introducing changes to processes. But we know that, you know, getting people's opinions to change is really, really tough because, you know, all of our opinions have built up over years and years. And, you know, we're all human. We all have biases um, and they are tricky to change, which is one of the reasons some of these doesn't tend to work. Um, and that's why we think it makes much more sense to say, here's a change to a process. And as long as that process is still objective and still transparent and kind of structured in and of itself, that doesn't necessarily need to mean that you're um, kind of creating an advantage for any particular group of people, just that you're making the process itself more fair, which should lead to better outcomes. So I think um, that, that's the way that we see a lot of these things as working. Great. And Suzanne, yes. So, you know, could you perhaps just talk a little bit more about what the guide says about positive action? Yeah, I mean, positive, I think positive action is often difficult for people to get their head around. Positive action can be taken where you have a, an underrepresentation or, or similar in your workforce and that you can take an action to address that. Um, people get worried that that then is and is discriminatory against other groups of people and I think you know it needs to be carefully managed properly communicated um, but it does point to culture of organizations I think um, you, you can you can take a step back and say well actually why why should we do this why should we have positive action and as a manager I've certainly been in the situation of of making sure that the positive action I take is is properly crafted but actually the reality is that change doesn't happen unless you make some form of intervention. So if you want everything to stay the same, then carry on doing what you're doing today. If you want things to change, and I guess we've seen this around, you know, whether it's the women on boards agendas or similar, if you make an intervention, if you set some targets and communicate the why, then those changes happen. I think the, the key to it all is always bringing people along and aligning the, the positive action that you take to the organization's strategic success and creating the kind of culture of workforce and workplace that you want to. But it, it is a difficult one. And I've certainly seen, you know, relatively recently, some pushback around those kinds of interventions. I think they are, you know, they, they take an art to manage them, but I think it's, it's strong management that does get those changes into organizations. Uh, and, you know, that's some of the things that we've heard about today. Absolutely is. And, you know, another another kind of key area we heard from uh, our senior leaders was around uh, using your initiatives to identify untapped talent in your own organization and boost employee engagement. So, uh, David, over to you on that one then, Nasheen, you know, how, how you've mentioned already during this conversation, but just to really kind of bring it home, I suppose, you know, what are the initiatives? What impact is it really having on the ground in teams? I know, Nasheen, you've shared some data on that, but, you know, do you have any kind of qualitative feedback? Do you have those kind of stories coming through from your teams and employees about the impact it's really making on their lives and their progression? Um, so perhaps, uh, David, over to you first, and Nasheen, over to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, like Nasheen, we have a, a great place to work survey. Um, and in this space, we get a lot of verbatim comments take a lot of time to actually go through but we do and we do score well in terms of our kind of a benefits proposition um in these areas and it's replicated in the feedback that we get from a great place to work survey so it it it, it takes up we've got some specific questions but the more interesting stuff's all in the verbatim comments and um, takes a lot of time out there but yeah we produce a kind of summary of the verbatim comments at the end as well so um we we, we see that we're getting um, a, a, a bang for our buck here, where we've made an investment or made decisions in this space, it, it's, it's replicated through our, our, our engagement survey. Great. Machine, anything to add? I think you're still on mute. Sorry, Machine. You may need to just come off mute. Thank you. Uh, we do, we've done a couple of things. So um, uh, we've, we do, we've done um, regular pulse surveys, um, uh, similar to David, to sort of capture um, uh, specifically uh, during lockdown uh, how, our, how our colleagues are, are doing and what the kind of general kind of 
sense and mood actually is and there's a, a lot of stuff that comes out of that um, qualitative uh, feedback um, but also when we have brilliant conversations when managers have brilliant conversations with um, um, direct reports um, we collectively at a sort of team and a departmental level capture those themes mm -hmm. and feed those back as well so we do have sort of a, a, a quantitative but also a qualitative means of, um, of finding out um, exactly what's going on across the organization from um, an equality diversity and inclusion perspective which we found hugely helpful and insightful thanks ever so much now i'm very mindful of time and it's been a, a great event lots of information and really uh if you've not already clicked on the uh, uh links that have been provided during the chat uh that take you to the toolkit please do there's a lot of information in there you can go into a bit more detail um on all of these case studies and as suzanne said at the start uh more um suzanne if i perhaps kind of come to you to to, to wrap things up slightly um, you know, you talked uh, earlier about uh, the importance of supply chains and procurement, but I, th I guess kind of speaking to the bigger picture here, I mean, companies that are looking to the future, looking at this building back better and building back more inclusively, you know, what, what really, who should be taking responsibility for this? I know in the toolkit, it all says that obviously we need to be involved in everybody, but what does responsibility look like in an organisation? Who should be paying attention to this toolkit the most? Well, I mean, I certainly think the board should have a focus on pay. Uh, it's often the biggest bill in any organisation and you need to make sure that you're getting the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak, um, as well as making sure that you're doing the right thing by your employees. Um, I think you know, the ability to win new work is often predicated now on a number of sustainability factors. And I think sustainability is often um, uh, paralleled with things around the green agenda, it's sometimes not paralleled with employment. And I think actually that's probably the biggest uh, thing for me in making sure that we see sustainability as a part or employment as part of the sustainability and actually fundamental to it. So for me, that, that would be a real focus that all boards should have in understanding that some of their biggest investment is wisely spent and is creating the kind of culture of organisation and the profile of organisation that, that it wants uh, going forward. Absolutely, fantastic. And thank you every, everybody for watching today and sharing their comments. If I um, perhaps just go around the circle, starting with Shoshana, and ask you in you know 30 seconds or less what, what would be your key message to the audience today which comprises of managers and leaders of all different types of organizations all different types of sectors and so on so Shishan, what would be your key message you'd like people to take home i'll say have a look at your own data to kind of identify your unique challenges um, and then have a look at actions which are evidence-based because um yeah lots of people have done this work to tell you what those are and then you'll get kind of more lasting change if you're able to do that. Fantastic. And going around the top, David, over to you next. Um, I would probably reiterate, understand your data, um, fix anything that's broken, um, set up action plans for the future and um, get better at telling your story. That's a great one to add on the end there, David. And machine over to you. Um, I, I would say it's about um, sort of leadership and sponsorship and making sure that, you know, your, your leaders are uh, explicitly and visibly supporting uh, this and that the organisation doesn't see um, gender pay gap reporting as just a compliance exercise, but an intrinsic part of, um, of your culture. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. And Suzanne, give you the opportunity to just very quickly wrap up uh, with a key message from EHRC today? Well, I mean, I think this has been um, a really uh, good seminar or uh, webcast today. Um, we've, we've had some great examples of best practice, which I think is, is really important to the development of successful pay gap reporting uh, for companies across the spectrum, and there are over 10,000. So um, I would encourage anyone who's looking at uh, gender pay gap reporting now to really reach out to the EHRC for that best practice, look on the websites, have a look at what's going on, 
And actually, you know, if you if you want to know more, then clearly the CMI and the EHRC are good sources of, of that kind of expertise. Don't feel that you need to make it up from scratch. Often people have already been through some of the pain of uh, development of some of these strategies, but understand how pay links to your strategy and the strategy of your organization and make gender pay gap reporting work for you as an organization and not just be a, a reporting obligation. Absolutely. And that, that brings me to uh, close the event today by uh, really talking about, um, well, offering my, extending my thanks to everybody that's joined today. I'd really like to extend the offer um, to engage further, both with CMI women, but also um, across our other activities, for example, around race equity. I know we didn't get the opportunity to fully start discussing intersectionality and looking at ethnicity pay reporting as well, but that's obviously a key part of work for CMI as well. So lots of opportunity to continue sharing best practice. As a call to action, please do download the toolkit now, share it wide and far. You can send it around, you can put it in your email signature, you can put it on social media, we don't mind, we encourage it entirely. And please do get in touch with CMI. If you'd like to share your own experiences, you can email cmiwomen at managers.org.uk as well. But it goes without saying, thank you ever so much for joining Suzanne, David, Nasheen, Shoshana, and everybody that's joined us today. Good afternoon.